Okay, we are going to get started now. We do try to get everyone back to work by 1 o'clock. Just a reminder for those who are on, um, please note that there is a question and answer uh, field at the lower portion of your screen. We encourage you to submit questions uh, as our speaker is presenting and we will respond to those questions. Um, they are anonymous, so don't worry about that. Um, I receive the questions in, and then um, our presenter and I will discuss them, OK? Uh, we are recording the session, and we'll post the link to the recording on the Chambers Online Member Center. So we have about half a dozen people joining us today from around the county which is great. We really appreciate you joining. Uh, we hope you continue to be engaged in the series and that, we that you help us spread the word to other members. Uh, Brooke wanted me to be sure to thank Clarkson University for hosting the webinar and assisting with this initiative for members and to St. Lawrence University for being a sponsor uh, for this educational series. We will now get started. Uh, we will pause throughout the presentation to take questions, so feel free to type them in at any time. Uh, there will be time at the end for any remaining questions. And also, just to note, if at any time you want to um, uh, increase the size of the slides that you're about to see, you can do that by clicking the arrows up in the upper right-hand corner of the uh, slide presentation box there. So that will maximize that on your screen and you'll be able to see those um, in greater detail. So with that, let's get started. I'm very happy to introduce our presenter. Tracy Thomas is the Executive Director of the Nature Center in Messina, New York. Prior to that, she was the Manager of Visitor Experience at the Wild Center in Tupper Lake, where she spent 10 years managing their 150 member volunteer program. Tracy is a certified volunteer administrator and has spoken at conferences on demographics and volunteering and on the up and coming field of virtual volunteering. Ooh, I love that. When not teaching outdoor education or working with volunteers, Tracy enjoys hiking, kayaking, adventure activities, and time with her dog. And with that, uh, thank you for joining us, Tracy, and I will. Uh, turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to starting a volunteer program for your organization. I'm going on some fairly basic things today, but I can see from the poll that a number of you already have volunteers. But I think that's OK, because most of the steps that are here today also help solve any volunteer issues you might be having. So if you already have a volunteer program, feel free to follow along and ask any questions that relate as we go because these steps will also help build a stronger volunteer program for you. So to help us get started, I am Tracy Thomas. I'm currently the executive director in Messina, New York of a nature center. And shameless plug, we opened our doors at a ribbon cutting ceremony yesterday. So please feel free to come up and see our brand new shiny, fabulous facility. Uh, we are there, and uh, we'd be love, to, love to have some visitors. I started my career in volunteering um, as a small child because my mother frequently loaned us out to anyone who needed help, and I kind of fell in love with the idea of helping others. I was um, in college a member of Alpha Phi Omega, which is a fraternal service organization, and there got my start with organizing service projects, which sparked a definite interest. And then following college, although I'm an outdoor education um, person by trade from SUNY Plattsburgh. Uh, I always took the volunteer role in coordinating volunteers at all of my jobs and sort of made a career of it when I started at the Wild Center in 2006 and combined it with the other parts of my job as manager of visitor experience there. And as we said, I managed a 150 member volunteer program that did about 10,000 hours a year. And that was a very professionally based program that I started. And I sort of jumped in over my head and learned a lot along the way. And that's where I obtained my certified volunteer administrator credential as well. And as part of that, I'm putting my card into this so that you guys can feel free to contact me anytime. Um, as part of that certified volunteer administrator credential, I do need to do a certain number of mentor hours each year to maintain that. And so I'm always happy to help as part of that. And because I enjoy this field, anybody who's building a program or having some challenges with their volunteers. So please feel free to get in touch 
anytime, and I'm happy to see how I can help. I can't promise I have all the answers, certainly, but I can hopefully point you towards the right resources. So without further ado, um, so you want volunteers, or do you? Uh, my hint would be yes, yes you do. Uh, volunteers are wonderful, and they can do a number of things for your organization beyond the great things you're imagining. Because I know right now your eyes are lit up and you're thinking, I have this fence that needs painting and these envelopes that need stuffing and all these office folders falling off my desk that they could file and all these projects. But volunteers are also passionate and amazing and they will talk about your organization to their friends and family and they will post about you on Facebook and they will rave about you and they will be your biggest supporters. So you do want them, but you also want to do it in the right way and you want them to have a great time and you want them to love you. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how to make all of that happen. The first step is your assessment. You need to figure out who you want and why you want them before you bring them into your facility. And if you already have them, that's OK. Don't get rid of them and start over. But you do want to step back and take a look at the ones you're using and make sure you're using them properly. So have a staff meeting. Oops. I pressed the wrong button, sorry. Nope. There we go. You want to have a staff meeting and brainstorm. And you want to look at all the different projects you have ideas for and hear what everybody's thinking. And you want to figure out where to start. What are your pressing needs that volunteers could help you with? Is there a backburnered project that somebody's dying to get you help that a volunteer could do? Or if somebody took something else off your plate, could you get to the backburnered project? Get all those things on a list. And then figure out where to start. How is a volunteer going to help you? And you need to be specific. Not just, I want volunteers because we have too much to do. What actual things are the volunteers going to do for you? And then figure out who are they going to work with, and as far as who's going to manage them, who's going to tell them what to do. And then start slowly and build up. I saw that a bunch of you selected you wanted more than 20 volunteers this year, and that's a fantastic goal. But you may not want to start with dropping all 20 on your heads at the same time tomorrow. So you may want to start with a couple and go from there. Um, so that you make sure you've tested the waters before you jump in with all of them at once. And then proceed when your organization is ready. When you know how you're going to use them, then by all means, put those notices in the paper, and we'll talk about recruitment in a little bit, and start bringing them in and making use of them. But the first thing you need to do is figure out what you want them for. I'm going to take a really brief, because this, <laughs> this slide right here covers things that whole books have been written about. But really briefly, there's four main types of volunteers. And I wanted to delve into this quickly, because probably your organizations could use all four types and currently use at least three of the types, um, virtual being the exception. But we're talking mostly about two of these today. So I wanted to delve into this slide. Episodic volunteers are your one-time volunteers. This is your, uh, this weekend I have a parks cleanup day, for example. You guys may have a once a year big time envelope stuffing where you do a member mailing of 5,000 envelopes. These, or a Earth Day cleanup day. These are your one-time, you recruit some college students or some Girl Scouts and they come out for these one-time big events. Those are called episodic volunteers in the volunteer world. And while you might want to get their emails and make sure they're safe people to work around, they're not really who we're talking about here today in terms of management. They're great to have. We love them and we need them. But they're not who we talk about when we're managing and recruiting volunteers. I could, like I said, write whole books about episodic volunteers and their wonders. But we're going to set them aside for right now. Virtual volunteers, which is another topic, again, I present on, those are off-site. I had a volunteer. Um, from Greece who managed a website for me who I literally never met. We talked via Skype. I never met in person. Um, this is another field where you can recruit people through websites and things that focus on volunteers who are not on site but who do work for you, such as photo editing or web management. Um, I had one who did all my birthday cards, who I mailed stamps and birthday cards. But again, this is another category. And if you're interested in having virtual volunteers, you can expand into that. And I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But we're going to set the virtuals aside for today, too. 
We're going to focus on your regular and project volunteers. Those are the people who come to your site and who work directly with you, um, with your clients, or on your site doing work for you. And there's two separate groups. Your regulars, those are the people who sign up for your shifts. From 9 to 12 on Tuesdays, they check out the people at your thrift store. They manage your front desk and your phones. Those are people who are your steadfast core members. Those are your ongoing, your regular crew. Project volunteers are folks who, this is the changing face of volunteering. So millennials and baby boomers both love this new type of volunteering. They're dedicated to your organization. They may stay with you for many years. But they don't want to commit to a regular scheduled thing. They don't want to come every Tuesday for months and months and months or years. They don't want to be your they don't want to be looking at a 10-year commitment of the same job. But they'll take a project that's a month long that may be four days a week that lasts two months. And then they might go away for three months while they're volunteering for somebody else. But then you have another cool project that's two months long, four days a week again, that they'll come back for. So you never lose them, but you don't have them all the time. Those are your project volunteers. Those people you keep on your email list, and you email them every project that's coming up. And they'll take the ones that fit their interests and needs, and that they're able to do and to commit to. And then you won't hear from them when you don't have something that appeals to them. So those, it's two regular and project volunteers will form your core groups who do those jobs you're talking about. And you appeal to them a little bit differently, but you manage them the same way. So those are the two groups we're going to talk about forming a core program for today. So forming our program, we figured out our needs assessment, and we know who we're going for. We've, we know what we want. We know the jobs we need to fill. And now we know we're looking for project and steady, ongoing volunteers to fill those needs for us. So now we need, to, we need to get them on board. So I want you guys just to pause for just a second and think about what do you do if you were to hire a new staff member? What are the steps you take? And I'm not actually going to make you like write in to me or anything, because that would take forever. But what are the steps you take if you were hiring an intern or a new staffer? So to bring on new staff, you plan out their position, you advertise and recruit, you interview people, and then you make an offer and you hire, you orientate and train them, you supervise and manage them, and you evaluate them periodically. You do all of that not because you love doing all of those things with the passion of a thousand burning suns, because mostly it's kind of time consuming and a pain in the butt, I would imagine. You do all that because that's how it's successful. That's the system that works to get the best out of your staff and to help them succeed. So why would you expect any different from a volunteer who essentially works for you? So the best way to have a successful volunteer program is to do the exact same thing for your volunteers. Before you panic, because I know that sounds like a lot of work, it doesn't work the exact same way with volunteers. The steps don't have to be quite as in-depth and as time-consuming. Particularly, if someone's going to work for you two hours a week, it's not as time-consuming as it is with a full-time staffer. But the steps are, logically, the same as they would be for a staff. To help a person succeed, you need to train them and put some time in up front. The good news is that the time in up front pays out hugely in dividends down the road. The more work you put in up front to help them succeed, the higher a volunteer's productivity will be, the happier they'll be fitting into your facility, the better your staff and volunteer relations will be, and the less friction there will be. And the happier and more productive that person is, the better their impact at your organization is, the more likely they are to stay with you longer, and the more likely they are to encourage their friends and family to be part of your organization in some way. And that could be through donations, that could be through spreading word of mouth to bring in visitors or new clients. It could be through bringing in new volunteers. But the happier they are with you, the more they talk you up and help encourage your business to succeed. So again, I know it's intimidating to look at those steps when all you wanted was somebody to help answer your phone once in a while. But it really does pay off in the end to formalize your volunteer program. The other good news 
is that for most of you, a lot of this work has probably already started. If you have staff manuals and things, you're just going to port some of the information right over. You may have to simplify it a little bit for volunteers because not all of it will apply, but a lot of the information is stuff you've already created. You're not starting over. And then the other good news is a lot of this stuff already exists. I'm going to have, I have a slide with a bunch of resources at the end, and those resources provide templates and things where they've already laid out templates for job descriptions, templates for interviews, and things like that. So everybody in the volunteer field is very willing to share. And so people are sharing all this information, and they have it free on the internet. I'm happy to share the stuff I've written in the past. And so a lot of it is out there to already get you started. And uh, I'm going to pause. If anybody has any questions, please send them in. Um, I'll pause after the next slide in case anything is coming in, if you're still with me, because I haven't scared you away with all this information yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just go through the steps individually a little bit and how they apply to volunteers in the hiring, sort of the hiring process, quote unquote. Um, the job description doesn't have to be fancy. It can be just a few sentences. But when you met and decided um, with your staff the things you wanted a volunteers to do for you, just jot them down. You can keep it nice and simple. Um, but you want to know what you're telling them to do. That will avoid a lot of problems down the road. And then what you really want is when you meet with them and offer them a role in your organization, have them initial that too. It makes it clear for both of you. You're telling them, here's what your role is at our organization. And they're saying, OK, I accept that that's my role here. Occasionally, you'll run across a volunteer who down the road is challenging. They either try to do too much at your organization and maybe overstep their bounds a little. And this is where the job description completely saves your life. Because you can go back and say, here's what we agreed on your role is going to be. And you've got it right in front of you. So you now have a way of talking to them and solving your own problems because you put in a little work up front. And I got to tell you that probably one half the time when I have a volunteer problem or challenge, I'd rather use challenge than problem, I retract that word, um, it's solved by going back and looking at the paperwork up front, either the volunteer manual or the job description. And I'm able to really just talk it out with them on a first go round and look back at our materials. So that really does prove to be worth it. And I included a sample of a job description. Um, this is from my previous job at the Wild Center. Theirs is a little more formalized than yours needs to be. They decided to do, um, they modeled them after their staff job descriptions to look the same. Um, and it just really walks through everything from who, who their supervisor will be, just so they know who to ask questions to. And they put in here the days and times required. They have about 15 different volunteer positions available. And so they decided to lay that out because they also use these as a recruitment tool. When somebody is interested in volunteering, they put all the job descriptions in an envelope and say, why don't you take a look through these? And you can get an idea of what thing might interest you the most. And they include in their project any projects that are currently available and things like that as well. So for them, it also serves as a recruitment tool, which is an option. So if you have your job descriptions, um, you then need to fill them. So you've identified all your needs, and you're ready to go, and you want people. And for some of you, you want 20 plus people. So you're going to need to go and look for them. And this is key. Where do I find my people, and how do I get them to sign up? Um, we'll go in reverse order, because number the last one is actually the most common. Word of mouth is still always, no matter how many things I've tried, how many surveys I've done, and how many ways I've asked people how they got involved in the various organizations, word of mouth always trumps the others by about 50%. And it doesn't have to be me asking, but your other volunteers can help you ask. You can get your donors and members to help you ask. If you've got another type of supporter, um, a board, members, uh, your constituents, if you serve the public in some way, get other people involved to help you ask. Have their friends help you ask. Ask on your Facebook page. But asking people is still the number one way. When asked why they don't volunteer, that I wasn't asked, 
and a personal ask is still the strongest. Looking someone in the eye and asking is still always the best way to get a yes. Um, and the, I wasn't asked is still the number one reason people said they don't help. And I know it's hard to ask, but it is still your best bet. Um, other places you can look, local papers, ads are not very successful. Their success rate is very low, running like a, you know, like a paid ad advertisement. Um, they get lost in the shuffle. Uh, if you can get a newspaper to do an article, so-and-so is hosting an open house, or so-and-so is recruiting volunteers for a new program on some, you know, you're starting up some new program, those do get a better response. So um, if you have any contacts with the papers, you can try that. Church bulletins are pretty successful. Those scroll things on public TV actually get some responses. The colleges in this area um, often have students who are looking to pick up some work experience. And so if you can go through their employment centers, that's an option. Post some flyers in places students might see them, particularly if you have any jobs that could be related to a major. So that's an option you could go to. Um, high schools, if you have something that high school students could do, a lot of times there's clubs specific to your needs. Or groups like the National Honor Society need a certain number of hours um, to get inducted. So think about groups like that who either need hours who are who, or students who are looking to get senior privileges usually have mandatory hours. There's a lot of groups like that who are required to do hours. There's also a lot of students who are looking to build either college application or work experience who are looking for so, more skilled hours, I guess you could say who would love to do a project for you in order to build their resumes. So look around at groups like that. Flyers um, placed around the region, especially colorful things that attract the eye. You can hold an open house at your organization to let people know. Um, Volunteermatch.org, they're more national and obviously thus more ex um, successful at recruiting volunteers in more urban areas. If you're looking for virtual volunteers, Volunteermatch.org is an excellent place to go. And we'll talk more about them in another capacity in a bit, but they are a national clearinghouse where you can post for free any, um, any listings that you have. And it's often worth a post, particularly I would say in a college town, just to see if anything turns up. There are state and local registries. The United Way out of Plattsburgh, I believe, does have a registry for that area. And New York State does have a volunteer database. I've never had great luck with either one, but that's just because we're not in an urban enough area. They do get used down in Albany and things. We're just not in their market. Um, a brief note on ads, no matter where you're placing them, colorful, a picture draws attention. Uh, I wrote an ad here briefly. The top one is the same ad as the bottom one, only the bottom one makes me want to talk to people and the top one bores me to tears. So <laughs> think about your language when you're writing an ad. You want to tell people that they would be important to you if they came out and you also want to tell them that you'd be interesting to come work with. Just saying, hey, I want volunteers isn't going to have anybody come over. Saying they'd have a good time and they'd be important will make them more likely to come join you. Interview. And this is usually the one in talks like this where people get stuck and they're like, but Tracy, you can't make me. I, I don't want to. Interviewing is long and it's difficult and it takes a lot of time. Um, I will not lie to you. I have skipped this step before and normally I do regret it. You kind of have to interview in terms of at least asking them what role they hope to fill for you. But I would recommend talking them to them in person or on the phone at least to get an idea of their personality and fit. This is particularly important if you're a small staff. You don't want somebody who's going to rock the boat or cause upset in your office or be disruptive. And you want to at least try to get a feel for that. Which just brings us to the next point. Can you say no to somebody? And the answer is, of course you can. Is it difficult? Sure. Um, you really just have to say it. I, so people always ask me, how do you say no if you have somebody who you don't think is a fit? And the answer is, you just say it. You say it as politely as possible. 
If you have another spot you think they might fit, you can say that too. For example, if somebody applied to be a greeter at your organization, but you can barely get two words out of them during the interview, but you had some sort of behind the scenes job you think they might work for, you could suggest that. I'm sorry, but I don't think you're a fit for our greeter position. Could I suggest you try X for us? If they're not a fit at all, if you feel they'd be disruptive to your office environment or there's something about them that you just feel doesn't work, it is fine to say, I'm sorry, you're not a fit for our organization and leave it at that. It's no different than if somebody were applying for a job for you. You wouldn't take them just because they applied. And it's okay to do that with a volunteer. We have this tendency in our society to think because just because they're a volunteer, because they want a volunteer, that we have to take everybody, and that's simply not true. We've tended to allow volunteers to really disrupt work environments and to take over work environments and to cause problems for us, and that's completely not necessary, and you shouldn't allow that to happen. So it's okay to interview people and to hold them to a standard and to want people that really are going to work well for you and that's why you should interview and expect a good fit. On to orientation and training. Um, you're going to want a manual of some sort and again it doesn't have to be fancy. The volunteers don't care about your fonts. They, re they don't. They really really don't. I promise. Um, they do care what your organization's rules are. They want to get along well with your staff and organization. Um, again, we tend to fall back on the either just a volunteer, so we don't expect them to be in the same uniform we expect the staff to be in. Or we don't expect, you know, staff aren't allowed to chew gum at the front desk, but we let the volunteers chew gum because, well, they're a volunteer. Expect them to follow the same standards or you'll cause problems between your staff and your volunteers. And you're also sacrificing your customer service if you allow things like that because they're just a volunteer. So let them know what the rules are up front so that everyone's happy and more comfortable. And it, so then put forward a manual for them. And you can use a version of your staff manual um, and just copy stuff right over. But that will solve a large majority of the issues that I consult on in the volunteer world could be solved if someone just told them the rules up front. And to be honest, the volunteers, for the most part, in those situations would have loved it and been so much happier if someone just told them the rules up front. They don't mind rules. Most of them worked for a living in their earlier life and are retired, and they had rules then, and they were fine with it. So you're not doing them any favors by letting everything go and then being mad at them later. Um, if you have rules that are specific to volunteers, that's OK, too. A lot of times, this applies to safety. So there might be places that staff can go, but volunteers can't, for example. At the Wild Center, this applied to animal care areas, but also to some of the facility maintenance areas for insurance reasons. It's OK to have rules that are specific like that. And you just need to lay out um, what they are for the volunteers. Also, then, if you have some perks and fun things, uh, if you have a store and they get a discount or eating or they get invited to annual events or you're able to offer some sort of discount card or something to that effect. It's nice to include those in the volunteer manual because otherwise they read like boring rule books. So I always try to include something a little fun at the end just to you know spice up the boring rule book a little bit. Because they are volunteers and as much as you have to go over the rules and the rules will make everyone more comfortable in the end, it is also nice to remember that they came and gave their time to you. And then, of course, there's the on-the-job training part. And this is the one part that will flex greatly depending on where you work. So if they're working the front desk and really answering your phones and you know, just greeting people, their training is going to be pretty straightforward and simple. If you're handling, for example, domestic violence clients or something to that effect, and they have to react in the moment, know who to call and how to react appropriately, obviously there's going to be much more intensive on-the-job training. So this one's going to depend highly on your organization, and you'll know far more about that part than I will. Um, so I left this one pretty vague, but what I do want to say is make sure both parties are comfortable with how the job is going to be done before you walk away from the training part. Um, you want to know that you're feeling comfortable that that person is ready, but also make sure that they're comfortable.
And then you move on. Actually, in this part, it's kind of funny. Supervision and evaluation, you're pretty much done at this point. Not done, but if you've trained them right in things, and you've done your upfront work, this is where now they're trained and ready, they're out on your floor or working with your clients, they're answering your phones. You now are pretty chill and they're helping you with your work and you've got it easy from here on out and you've got volunteers working for you. Um, and you supervise them really by checking in and seeing how they're doing. And as far as evaluation, it can take a great many forms and this is where I've actually always been the weakest because once they're working for me, it's hard to remember to go back to that other stuff. Um, and what you see here is actually a group evaluation. The way I often solved it was once a year with each position at the Wild Center, we had a large group meeting where we talked about how everything had been going in that position and they gave feedback to each other. They role played some different scenarios that had come up and they also had their chance to tell the Wild Center how they thought the position should morph and change over the next year. So we evaluated each of them. but sort of as a general, but they also evaluated the actual position and told us how they thought it should change in any way. So that's what you see here. But yeah, these actually supervision and evaluation, if you do everything right up front, actually become the easiest part of the job. Uh, recognition is actually the really fun part. Um, I added this in, this was about starting a volunteer program. Recognition is sort of more an ongoing thing, but it does greatly help with uh, retention. And you do hope to, if you've put in all this volunteer work up front and you've made them happy, you hope to keep these same volunteers engaged for many years. So you're really putting in this work once and then you'll have the same core crew. Um, so it's more than an, one annual event. You could have an annual event. Those are awesome and they're a lot of fun. I did a movie night last year with tons of popcorn and a movie on the big screen. We had a blast. But you want your volunteers to be part of a community. So you can look for a great number of ways for that to happen and to allow them to meet and connect with each other. Because a lot of people want to get out of the house and meet people. That's part of the reason they volunteer. So look for ways to make that happen. But a really key thing, and this especially relates back to those project volunteers I was talking about that come to your organization in waves. They stick with you, but they will come and go and come and go. They want to know that they're part of something. They want to know your impact. So if you're helping feed the world or you're saving animals or whatever it is that you're working on that's a world problem, tell them how you're affecting society and tell them then how they're part of it. So your volunteers gave X number of hours and that contributed to X number of dollars that helped you meet your mission. They want to know that because they want to know how their time is making a difference. So you need to constantly be sharing that kind of information with them and that will help keep them with you. They don't, that group doesn't necessarily care as much about all the little things or the candy or the birthday cards. They want to know that their time is really making a difference in the world. And finally, treat them as individuals. When you have a small number of volunteers, this is really easy. As it gets larger and larger, it does get harder. But you want to chat with them periodically, and you really kind of want to know what their motivations are, just so you can respond accordingly. Does this person care about getting a birthday card most? And you want to make sure you're recognizing that. And they want to share pictures of their grandchildren visiting your site. Or is this person a person who really wants to know what their impact was? And they just appreciate that you recognize what, why they came to your organization. So as much as you can, you want to do that. And I'm going to add one more plug for a way, I know a lot of this, it's a lot of information and can be really intimidating, but here's a little hint. A lot of times you can find a volunteer that will help you with a lot of this. There are a lot of volunteer volunteer coordinators in the world. A lot of volunteer volunteer coordinators. And even if they only do a piece of this for you, a volunteer volunteer coordinator who does the recognition piece or who just coordinates some of the mailings and that end for you, you can actually find a volunteer who will help you with a lot of this work. It's really just a matter of finding the right person and there are ways you can do that. Um, but you just break down the job into tasks and then you recruit for that person. Um, so as much as this sounds like, you can also actually find volunteer help with coordinating your volunteer program. Sorry, that was a lot of words trying to spit out. Um, okay, sorry, now I just have a couple resources and then if you guys have any questions. I just tagged this on at the end. Um, Volunteer Canada, I know we're in the United States, but Volunteer Canada 
is brilliant. They have a number of downloadable ebooks and a great number of resources. When I first jumped into volunteer coordinating with both feet, they were my first, and they have remained an incredibly strong place to find information. Volunteer Match, which I mentioned earlier for posting your um, information, also has a series of free webinars. They have other information in, under their learning tab, but they also offer free webinars. They have beginning, intermediate, and advanced courses in their webinar series, and they offer two to three per month. Um, and then they rotate through them, and they're adding new ones every couple of months. And they are great to take. They're free. You can sign up anytime. So I strongly recommend those. Energize Inc. is sort of a clearinghouse of volunteer information. They list all the books in the world and things. But you can check them out. They also have a blog on volunteer information. And then Amazon has literally thousands of books on volunteering. Some are better than others, but if you're looking for a place to get started and pick up a couple easy how-tos, um, you can talk to me and I can recommend a couple I've tried that were pretty decent. Or just delve into the world of Amazon and you can find pretty much anything. Okay, I've now done all of the talking in all of the lands and so I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. And again, I invite you guys, I know I covered a lot, please feel free to contact me anytime and I am happy to talk volunteers. Okay, Tracy, thank you so much. A very informative presentation. Yes, I would encourage uh, participants to go ahead and submit any questions you might have. Uh, we have a few minutes left. We have plenty of time to address questions. I know I thought of one uh, while you were talking, so I can go ahead and go first, but I'll hope that others submit questions while we're talking. Um, <clears throat> so you talked about recognizing volunteers and um, that, you know, it, it sounded like th there were some things in there, but I wondered about uh, a benefits program or would you recommend volunteers being um, given access or given certain, I don't know, benefits having to do with their, their role in the organization, like, uh, like free tickets, access tickets to uh, the museum as an, an example, or, you know, other things that might sweeten the pot, so to speak, for enticing um, volunteers to participate? I do recommend it. Um, I think it helps bring volunteers, first of all, recruiting. Everyone is so busy in this day and age, and you are fighting so many other places that also want your volunteers' time and attention, that um, you really want to find ways to help sweeten the pot, like you said. So if you have little things like that, you don't have to do anything super fancy, but if you have little things like tickets you can do periodically, or you know, little awards, or you periodically send them something in the mail that reminds them that you exist and that you're thinking of them. Little things like that are great. One year we did a punch card. Businesses around the town offered 10% discounts, um, and we did a little punch card. They could use it once. Little things like that go a long ways. A lot of people never even used the punch card, but they thanked us hugely for getting it. It was the perception that we thought of them and gave them a the value more than actually the use of it, which was an interesting psychology experiment, but they loved getting it. So I do think those kind of things, when you can, if you can afford them or if you can get somebody to donate that stuff, makes a huge difference. Okay, good, good. Okay. Um, okay, let's see what we have. Oh, okay, oh. so they're looking for their card again, for your card. You should be able to, yep. I'm working back towards it. I'll do okay. that. So we have a, a, somebody's uh, written in and asked for the business card again. So we're going to go back to that. <clears throat> OK, so we have, well, while we're getting to the business card, we're scrolling back up. It takes a minute. Uh, we have another question that's come in from Sue. And Sue asks, uh, do you have specific tips on how to recruit a volunteer? volunteer program coordinator. So how do you recruit the coordinator? I do. Part of it is about writing the perception, the position description and who you look for. It helps if you already have some volunteers to pick from. If you don't, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, but you write a position description and this might be one you target for a little more specifically. So you do more targeted advertising, and you're essentially looking for someone. I'm just gonna okay, sorry. sorry. Oh, you're fine. That's 
maybe in this case retired from an office job or has previous office experience. So we might do a little more targeted recruitment and ask around to people you know um, who, who might know of someone who was in an office field or a business field. And you're going to be looking for that specific ask. Um, so I'm not doing a very good job explaining what I mean. So you're going to First, you're going to write up your job description of what you want and figure out what part you want them to do. But then you're going to ask around to friends of your organization. Do they know somebody who retired from an office job or somebody who was in an office field who might do volunteering or be looking for volunteering time? And you can also post it specifically. You might People might not know what a volunteer coordinator is, so you might be, say, looking for a volunteer assistant, looking for an office assistant, very detail-oriented, 10 hours a week, etc. So you're going to be very specific in what you're looking for. But then you're going to ask people who are connected to your organization to help you find a volunteer who's retired from an office job, very detail-oriented, etc. And then you're going to do the personal ask. So you're going to have them introduce you to somebody. Is this? It's hard to talk. Sue, since you know me, we can also talk offline. But we're going to do a targeted ask um, through people you know. Um, and then they're going to connect you one-on-one -on -one to do the personal ask. But in this case, you're looking for something specific. And you're going to try a person that eye-to-eye -eye request. Um, and you, yeah, so in this case, I really think you want a retired, somebody who's retired from an office field. And because it's so specific, You'd want to go to your membership program, the people with the SLIP partnership, et cetera. Ask us all if we know anybody who's retired from an office job. And then we would specifically approach that person, take them to lunch, et cetera. Ask them if they're interested in a, part -time, in a volunteer position that would be a few hours a week. And then we would make the personal ask. And it might take two or three people till you get it. But I'm betting there's somebody out there who would be interested in a, in a personal request. OK. Good. Again, that one-on-one -on -one asking. It's the one-on-one -on -one yeah. one ask and finding somebody who's retired from a position that was skilled. In this case, you're looking for a skilled volunteer, and that's OK. Yeah. You don't want to put out a general recruitment for something like that, necessarily, and get a ton of applications in that you then have to wade through that aren't related, because you're looking for something so specific in this case. Somebody who could do this needs very coordinated office tasks. Um, so. It'd be the same if you were looking for, say, pro bono legal skills. You wouldn't just put it out there, I'm looking for a pro bono lawyer. You'd ask friends if they knew a lawyer who could give a few hours a week or a retired lawyer. And then you'd ask them to make the connection. And then you'd go ask that person. Mm -hmm. So in this case of a skilled job, you first figure out exactly what you're asking for, how many weeks, how many hours you think you'd need. And then you ask friends first if they know somebody or people related to your group. And then we'd go out and make the ask. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, uh, saying no to a, a, a not fit person, not fit volunteer for a certain role. I wondered if you had some um, uh, suggestions for dealing with a uh, volunteer once they're in that role and maybe they're not performing um, as you'd hoped, even in like a, a reliability capacity, like you, you know, they've They've committed that they're going to volunteer three hours a week, and they're not showing up for their shift, in other words. Um, you know, how are some things that maybe you might say that you would deal with, how, how to deal with that situation? Um, the, I certainly have. I've had this happen a number of times, and I have actually fired volunteers. It both is possible and can be done. It's awkward and uncomfortable, but, well, things happen. Um, the first step is, of course, if you have those job descriptions, you can fall back on. If you don't, it's still OK. You have the conversation. Um, the first step is not that different than an employee. You really just need to sit down and talk and say, you know, our, we really need our vol I know you're a volunteer, and you give our time to us, and we really appreciate the time that you give us. But because we rely on our volunteers, we're a small staff, we rely on our volunteers, you're really part of our team, we need to know you'll be here when you say you will. Is something going on? Can we work out a different schedule? What's up? So first, you just let them know you've noticed that you do rely on them. You have the talk so that everybody knows what's going on. It's on the same page that you do need them to be where you need them to be. And then you hope that 
it's changed. You give it a week or so, or however much till the next. If you still see a problem, then you have to have the, we're not going to be able to continue with you as a volunteer if I can't rely on you, or if X problem continues. And this is, of course, if it were a safety or something else, you need to cut it off sooner. Right. But this is, and uh, so if the problem continues, you know, this is your warning. We won't be able to continue past the next time if, you know, you you aren't where I need you to be. Would you like to select another position that maybe doesn't have the same requirements or cut back to one shift? Or what are our, here's our options, mm -hmm. whatever you've decided the options are. Mm -hmm. If they then miss a shift or whatever happens, I'm sorry, but at this time you can't be a volunteer for us. If things change for you, we would be interested in having you back in the future. We can talk or not, depending on the circumstance. Right. But I'm going to replace you for, for now. OK. And it's awkward and it's uncomfortable right. as these things are, but it does happen. If you have another role they could help with, um, that's great. But if not, you sometimes do just have to let a person go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I did think of one more. So I'm, I, if there's others, certainly chime in. Uh, I thought about I thought about the project oriented volunteers, mm -hmm. and you said how they come in waves. Do you have uh, specific processes or suggestions on bringing them back into the fold? Like, you know, how do you keep them re-engaging them? Because if they're not, you know, with you all the time, you have to kind of bring them back in. And so is there, you know, email lists? You, 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 you know, how do you bring yep. them back? We actually, I didn't talk about this a lot today, but I use, I use, we use. There's a ton of different volunteer tracking software programs out there. There's free ones. There's other ones. I use a low-cost program called Volgistics. That's V-O-L-G-I-S-T-I-C-S. -I -I and uh, it allows you to track volunteers, record their hours. They can log their own hours. It does a million different things. But it also allows you to email them all at once or email just the ones who have hours being a greeter or just the ones who are volunteer naturalists, whatever the case may be. So it has a lot of different functions. So I can email just the ones who have worked on a project or just the ones. I can email everybody once a week, whatever the case may be. So we keep everybody on an email list. And during the summer at the Wild Center, we emailed everybody weekly with all the open jobs. Now, that's not necessary right now at the Nature Center because we're not even up and running. Or we are now, sort of. Um, the doors are open anyway. But we can email whatever projects we have available. And by keeping reminding them that we exist is one thing. Sending little notes, um, sending a newsletter is another way. You just want to keep them thinking that you still exist, reminding them that you're there. Um, if you have something come up that you're not getting bites on, that nobody's taking, you might pick up the phone and give those people a call and say, hey, look, I know this one didn't you know, tickle your fancy the first time around, but I really didn't get anyone. Is there any chance you could help us out this time? Keep them engaged, whether it's reading your newsletter and things, um, coming up with a project. Call them and say, hey, look, you haven't picked, in the last few months, you haven't grabbed any projects for us. Is there something you'd be interested in working on for us? Maybe we could work something out, because they might just haven't nibbled because something didn't grab them. The hardest part of project volunteers is actually your staff. Staff are leery of giving up anything, in many cases, but envelope stuffing. <laughs> and I don't mean actual, literal mm -hmm. envelope stuffing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of staff are still reluctant to have volunteers do actual, meaty work. They want to give them clear my desk stuff and not projects. It's OK to let volunteers run with actual work. You may Sure, you may need to meet with them or tweak it a little at the end or whatever the case may be. But you can, you can have volunteers really tackle, especially some of these college students and things. They can run with projects. And that's OK. Um, so if you've got something that's been backburnered for two years and you haven't been able to get to it, give them a go. What's the worst that can happen? And maybe, you know, put those things on your project list. And maybe no one bites, but maybe some of these project volunteers tackle it for you and at least get something started. Um, so with project volunteers, I'd say two things. Keep them engaged. Keep newsletters and things coming so they rem remember that you exist. Keep them on a mailing list. Check in with them once in a while. But also, don't be afraid to toss all of your different projects out there. And maybe somebody grabs at one and gets it up and running for you. OK. Good. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, guys. OK. Uh, with that, I don't see any other questions. So we'll go into our uh, the closing view of our presentation. Uh, 
as mentioned, we have the feedback form, and so please go ahead and finish up your submissions and click that submit button so we get that feedback. Um, a word about next month, Jennifer McCluskey Photography will present on improving your promotional images. So certainly mark your calendar for that uh, event on Wednesday, June 7th at 12 o'clock. And um, certainly, if you have any topic ideas, please let Brooke know, and she can work on recruiting a speaker. If you're interested in, pr in presenting, she would also love to talk to you more about that. Uh, thank you again, Clarkson and St. Lawrence University, for sponsoring the series. We really appreciate the time and expertise. And uh, for webinar recordings, you will be able to go to slcchamber.org. Uh, well, you can go there to view the past presentations, and this one will soon be posted, okay? Uh, appreciate your time here today, Tracy, again, and uh, we hope everybody has a great day.